Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today's video is the first of what will hopefully become a series of new videos on the channel, a little project we've been working on for a while. As you'll have probably already read in the title, this video is a full graphic settings guide for Shadow of the Tomb Raider, complete with benchmarks for every single graphic setting in the game. The original idea was to get this video out, uh, I guess, much closer to the actual launch of Shadow of the Tomb Raider, but due to the NVIDIA RTX launch, we kind of postponed it a bit. That content was probably more important, but at least we're now getting around to providing you this information, and hopefully with future games, we'll be able to get it out a bit closer to the launch date. So the premise of this video, it's pretty simple. We're going to benchmark every graphic setting in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, showing you the visual quality differences through a bunch of side-by-side -side comparisons, while also providing a performance breakdown. Hopefully you'll be able to see the differences in settings quality, and then you can use the performance info to see which settings are the best to use. At the end, we'll go through our recommended picks for each setting to give you the best balance of visual quality and performance, at least in our opinion. And Shadow of the Tomb Raider is an absolutely beautiful game, so you'll want to crank up everything as high as possible while still delivering a playable experience for your hardware. All the performance data you're about to see was captured using my Core i7-8700K test rig in the Be Quiet Dark Base 700. We've benchmarked every setting using flagship GPUs from both AMD and Nvidia. On the AMD side, we have the Radeon RX Vega 64, and for NVIDIA, the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. As AMD and NVIDIA use different graphics architectures, there could be some performance differences between the cards, so we thought it was best to test with both. Due to time and resource constraints, we weren't able to also add in budget or mid-range cards like the GTX 1060 or RX 580. If you would like to see those in future videos of this kind, consider supporting us on Patreon so we can allocate a bit more time to test other sets of graphics cards. In any case, I'll be commenting throughout the video on where lower end cards might stumble, but for the most part, these results should hold true for less powerful GPUs, provided you're still GPU limited like we are in this video. Final thing to note, all the in-game captures you see here were taken at 4K with the RTX 2080 Ti. Vega 64 struggles to play this game at 4K with the highest quality settings, so for Vega we benchmarked the settings at 1440p. Other than that, everything else was kept the same and the latest optimized drivers for both cards were used. Also, note that the in-game benchmark was used for all performance testing. The captures you see are only to show the visual differences. That's not where we tested those exact settings. Actually, one last additional thing. To spot some of the quality differences we're talking about, we recommend watching this video at YouTube's maximum 4K quality setting and setting the video to full screen on a decent sized display. And there won't be any zooming, pausing, or slowing down the footage we captured. If you can only spot the differences zooming in the footage, you're probably not going to notice during regular games. Gameplay. So let's start with the simplest comparison, the in-game presets. There are five presets in total, ranging from lowest to highest, and anti-aliasing is independent of these presets. For all our testing, we used SMAA T2X as it provided the best visual quality without a ridiculous performance penalty, though we'll cover AA in a bit more detail later. From a quick inspection, there appears to be very little quality difference between the highest and high presets. There's a slight change to shading and a small reduction in texture quality and detail, but it's pretty hard to spot the differences. Medium drops the level of detail a bit further, and in comparison to high, you can start to see the differences with harsher shadows and less geometry. Low strips back things pretty noticeably compared to the higher settings, while the lowest preset looks uh, pretty terrible with basically all lighting effects completely stripped out. In terms of performance, it's a surprise to see such a large difference between the high and highest presets. You can expect to see 22% more performance with Vega and 26% more with the 2080 Ti simply by turning down one preset with a small impact to the visual quality. Perhaps even more surprising is you don't gain that much more performance dropping from high to medium despite a more noticeable drop in visual quality. And then of course at the lower end you gain a fair bit of performance playing on low for a large drop in quality. I'd only use the lowest preset if you're running on an absolute potato. Judging by what we're seeing here, if you don't want to mess around with anything but the presets, my advice is to play the game on high if your hardware is capable. If you're running into resource limits, for example, your car's memory is being exceeded, dropping to medium would be a good choice as it reduces texture and geometry load, and you might see a larger performance improvement than we showed here with the high-end cards. But those with high-end cards, they really shouldn't be playing on medium as it doesn't improve performance all that much when you have a large GPU with plenty of VRAM. There are some settings you can raise higher than the highest preset, which 
I guess doesn't make a lot of sense considering the preset is called highest. Anyway, you can turn up texture filtering, shadow quality, level of detail, and screen space contact shadows up another notch. Doing this shaves off a few frames per second, but doesn't improve quality in a noticeable way, so I'd recommend sticking to the highest preset, or even better, just using high, as we just talked about. Anti-aliasing is the next thing to look at as it's independent of the presets. The level of AA you should use does depend on the resolution of your display, and typically you won't need as much AA at 4K compared to 1080p for a nice, sharp, clean image. This footage was captured at 4K, and it can be a bit hard to spot the differences, but I played through a lot of the game at 1440p, so I have some additional thoughts on AA based on that experience. Shadow of the Tomb Raider's graphics menu recommends you play the game with TAA enabled, or Temporal Anti-Aliasing. I'm normally a bit hesitant of that as I've seen plenty of TAA implementations that are no better than a blur filter, but Shadow of the Tomb Raider uses decent TAA and for the most part I think it provides a quality upgrade on SMAA, particularly around fine detail like Lara's hair. Moving up to SMAA T2X sharpens up the image a bit more compared to TAA without introducing the artifacts present in SMAA. It's hard to spot at 4K but at 1440p textures were that bit sharper with SMAA T2X. Of course, we also have SMAA 4X, providing the best quality anti-aliasing, but it's only a small improvement over SMAA T2X in my opinion, especially at 4K. And in terms of performance, well, don't bother using SMAA 4X as it's the most performance demanding setting in the entire game, and the quality improvement you get is minimal. Switching from SMAA T2X down to TAA does improve performance by 2-3%. I'd probably recommend doing that at 4K, but with lower resolutions, SMAA T2X does provide a sharper presentation, which I feel is worth it for this small performance hit. Also interesting to note that disabling AA on the RTX 2080 Ti noticeably improves performance, whereas there is no difference in performance between the first three anti-aliasing modes on Vega 64. Not that I'd recommend playing with anti-aliasing disabled. At this point, if you don't want to do any further tweaking, I'd recommend playing the game using the high preset with SMAA T2X or TAA, depending on your resolution. Now let's look at individual settings from top to bottom and see if we can optimize things a bit further. Starting with textures, typically this is the setting you only need to adjust if you're running out of VRAM, which won't be an issue with either Vega 64 or the RTX 2080 Ti, but might be an issue with more entry-level cards. Visually, there's a slight difference to the clarity of textures between high and ultra at 4K, though I'd be surprised if you could tell the difference at lower resolutions. There is some quality loss going back down to normal, visible in the fur on the back of Lara, as well as the cloth and wood in the background. The largest change is moving from normal to low textures. Low is very blurry with a lack of pronounced detail, while normal is actually respectable. In any case, when we look at the performance data, there's barely any difference between normal and ultra on the RTX 2080 Ti, while with Vega, 1% lows are impacted slightly. For Vega, I'd probably recommend using high textures due to the 3% improvement to 1% low performance, especially if you were playing at 1440p or lower. For the 2080 Ti, crank it to ultra and don't look back. Texture filtering is an interesting one because it's set to just 8x when using the highest preset and then just 4x when using the high preset. Visually, there's a subtle difference between the maximum 16x and lowest 2x anisotropic modes, but distant and off-angle textures are noticeably clearer when using 16x compared to 2x. Bilinear is the most basic mode, which reduces quality slightly compared to 2x. As you can see looking at the performance data, there's only a small difference in performance between 16 times anisotropic and bilinear filtering, especially on Vega 64. 16x does allow textures to shine in all their glory, so my recommendation here is to crank it to 16x. This setting is really only important in very resource constrained cards. Higher end GPUs should have no real issues with 16x, which is why it's a bit bizarre that 4x is the default for the high preset. In a lot of games, shadow quality is the setting that has the largest impact on performance. However, with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, there's not a massive difference between the quality of the various shadow settings. Maybe the name of the game has something to do with that. Changing this setting affects the softness of shadow edges, with Ultra providing the softest and most natural results, and Low giving a sharp shadow presentation. Ultra is marginally better than High, but I honestly couldn't tell the difference between High and Normal. Going from Normal to Low is the largest quality difference, well, except for turning shadows off entirely. 
which significantly affects the presentation. In fact, turning shadows off makes the game look 10 years older. It's pretty remarkable how crucial that simple lighting effect is to more realistic visuals. In terms of performance, you'll gain about 4% from downgrading shadows from ultra to normal, which I feel is a good trade-off considering the very minor visual difference. Switching from normal to low has a small impact on the RTX 2080 Ti and a slightly larger impact with Vega, but the sharp shadow presentation is noticeably inferior for only a small performance improvement. So normal is the best balance between visual quality and frame rate. Ambient occlusion is one of the most crucial settings to optimize in terms of visual quality and performance. Shadow of the Tomb Raider includes three modes, off, BTAO, which is Eidos Montreal's custom AO technique, and HBAO Plus, an NVIDIA AO method that works on both NVIDIA and AMD cards. Uh, one of those very few features developed by NVIDIA that actually works on the red team. There's quite a noticeable difference between all three modes, with each step providing more depth to the image, more subtle shadowing, and just a better image in general. HBAO Plus is the winner here, but BTAO is a large step up from having no ambient occlusion. Looking at the performance data, it's clear that BTAO is the best AO method to use from a performance perspective. On the RTX 2080 Ti, enabling BTAO only comes with a small performance hit compared to no AO. On Vega 64 the hit is slightly larger but it's still manageable. It's when you enable HBAO Plus that performance drops a fair bit and surprisingly it's the 2080 Ti that's hit the hardest despite HBAO Plus being an NVIDIA developed AO technique. For most gamers I think BTAO gives the best balance of performance and visual quality but considering HBAO Plus is a noticeable step up those with higher end cards might like to enable the setting if they are already getting decent performance. Unlike some top-end settings that do barely anything for visual quality, you can at least tell when HBO Plus is on. Depth of field is one of the more contentious settings. Some people love it, some hate it. The normal setting applies a background blur in some circumstances. It's quite a good blur implementation too. Pushing it up to high enables a foreground blur in some areas as well, depending on the scene. As this is a personal preference thing, I'll leave it up to you to decide which setting you'd like to use. Personally, I like depth of field, so I'll put it on high when I'm gaming. The performance difference between high and normal is noticeable but only a few percent and that only comes into play for the few times foreground depth of field is utilized in general gameplay. The difference between normal and off is pretty minimal. Looking at the level of detail modes, it's clear why the game uses the high mode for the highest preset rather than ultra. There's essentially no difference. The normal, low and lowest modes all reduce geometry detail and detail draw distance slightly with each step and I think the difference is between each of those modes are noticeable enough that you should try to use high where your hardware allows. In terms of performance, you can gain up to 3% on Vega 64, switching from ultra to high for basically no quality difference. And on both cards, there are small gains to be had for each subsequent reduction in level of detail. Considering high does provide better quality than normal, again, my advice is to use the high preset where possible. Tessellation, this is an easy one. Enabling the setting provides more depth to geometry, particularly the rough ground Lara is often walking over. It's a noticeable change and one that doesn't come at a large performance cost on either the RTX 2080 Ti or Vega 64, so I'd recommend leaving it enabled. Bloom is a subtle effect that's most noticeable in the darker or night scenes in the game. It provides a subtle glow around light sources that in my opinion does improve image quality, though I know there are some that will turn off this effect immediately. Uh, disabling the effect gives you about a 2% performance improvement if you're interested. Motion Blur is the most controversial of all graphic settings, with most people preferring to disable it. I actually think the Motion Blur implementation in Shadow of the Tomb Raider is excellent, especially compared to a lot of other games, so I reckon you might want to at least try turning it on to see what you make of it. In any case, when it comes to performance, it's one of the first settings I'd disable, as turning off Motion Blur improves performance by 5%, which isn't a surprise considering the high quality implementation. Screen space reflections are important for realistic reflections and lighting in the game, particularly when it comes to the large expanses of water in various environments. There is a large visual quality difference between having SSR on or off, with on providing a more realistic reflection system, though there are still reflections when SSR is disabled. You can see here the water looking a lot flatter with SSR off, so I'd keep it enabled if you have the GPU power. In terms of the performance hit, turning off SSR will give you a 4% improvement to frame rate, so it's one of the more expensive effects, but one I think adds a lot to the presentation. Screen space contact shadows are a bit of an enigma. I spent 
ages poring over footage of the game to spot the difference this shadowing technique makes, because disabling them improves performance by up to 9%. But most of the time I literally could not tell the difference whatsoever, and in the places I did spot the changes, the effects of contact shadows were so minor that I'd rather just turn it off and gain an extra 3-5 to five FPS. And for the difference between the high and normal modes, I have no idea what the difference is. Pure hair is enabled at all times in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, so you get a nice physics-based hair simulation regardless of whether you set it to low or normal. Upgrading to normal increases the amount of strands being simulated and the overall density of Lara's hair, which to me looks more natural than the low setting. There is a small performance hit when making that change, and depending on how much you care about Lara's hair, uh, you might consider turning it down to low for a 2% performance improvement. Final setting we're looking at today is volumetric lighting. As you can see from the comparison, this has a pretty significant impact on how the game looks. Turning the setting off results in flatter and less impressive lighting, while turning it on is the default for all but the lowest preset. And that makes sense because there is basically no performance difference between having it on or off. The last two settings you see in the menu are for lens flares and screen effects. Both are optional cosmetic things that have no impact on performance. So now you've seen how every setting in the game performs and the visual quality differences between them. I think the high preset is a really good starting point, but with a few small tweaks, you can get nearly the same visual quality as the highest preset, but with around 30% more performance. Performance will also be around 4% better than the high preset for essentially identical visual quality. And overall, these settings you're seeing here provide a great balance of visual quality and performance. And of course, if you have weaker hardware, you can individually tweak a few settings as shown earlier to improve your frame rate. So that just about does it for our Shadow of the Tomb Raider graphics setting guide and performance evaluation. I'm sure you've seen enough of Lara Croft's arse cheeks for one video. Uh, I've been playing a fair bit of the game myself. It's an absolutely stunning game graphically, particularly if you have the hardware to run it at 60 FPS or above at a decent resolution. So I reckon we'll be benchmarking it for quite some time, especially as the top quality settings are very demanding. Obviously, as it stands right now, neither ray tracing nor DLSS are available in the game for NVIDIA RTX owners, though both features should be coming in a future update, so we'll retest the game when those features are available. That's it for now. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Consider supporting us on Patreon to get access to our exclusive Discord chat, and let us know what other games you'd like to see. Get this treatment in the comments section below. I'll catch you next time.